Roman, where are you going? Okay, yeah. Hello, everyone. Um, I would like to just, uh, well, I was going to say a prelude to what Gordon has just presented, but because he hasn't been able to, um, I'll start a bit further down, but um, in regards to the cosmic beginning, okay, um, that Gordon will try and share later, astrophysicist Fred Hoyle um, said, I do not believe that any scientist who examined the evidence would fail to draw the inference that the laws of nuclear physics are deliberately designed. So before I begin my part of the presentation, a bit about myself. I'm a primary school teacher by profession, and while I've grown up amongst Christians, I've, I all, have always found myself questioning and digging deeper into the truth claims made by the Bible. In recent years, I've been broadening my understanding of what makes Christianity unique amongst the world's religions and looking at the scientific evidence for a creator. So I'll, be, I'll continue the presentation tonight after from where Gordon has finished, which would have been um, the um, cosmic beginning, proposing the question, what needs to happen in order to make our galaxy cluster habitable, our galaxy habitable, our solar system and our planet habitable for life? I might add not just any life, but advanced life like human beings or the equivalent. What does it take? So this is a presentation of some of the fine tuned features of our universe. My talk tonight is based on um, astrophysicist and um, author and international speaker, Dr. Hugh Ross's books, Improbable Planet and uh, the Creator and the Cosmos, and his two, uh, 2019 lecture shown here, the Emeritus Lecture, both of which I would encourage you uh, to read and watch. I include my sources at the bottom of each slide, I also want to acknowledge Dr. Ross's reason.org website uh, for numerous blogs and information on this topic. If you want to personally message him or question him about anything raised tonight via Facebook or Messenger or Twitter, he will respond, which I would encourage anyone watching this to do. I can also, you can also contact him through his website as shown here, where you can also get free chapters of his 19 books. Um, I've also used uh, both NASA and Wikipedia and other sources to clarify some information and for some extra research included and some pictures. Now, some of the books that follow a similar theme include um, Donald Brownlee's book and Peter Ward's book, The Rare Earth, Lucky Planet by David Waldham, The Goldilocks Enigma by um, Paul Davies and um, George Greenstein's book, The Symbiotic Universe. Okay, um, I want to begin um, sharing a few quotes from some non-theistic scientists, so people that uh, do not hold um, a creator in mind, who are immersed in this field of study, um, which suggest, as cosmologist Edwin Harrison puts it, the fine tuning of the universe provides prima facie evidence, that is, appearance of deistic design. Cosmologist Bernard Carr wrote, one may... Uh, one would have to conclude that either the features of the universe invoked in support of the anthropic principle are only coincidences or that the universe was indeed tailor-made for life. Um, astrophysicist David, Paul Davies said, there is for me powerful evidence that there is something going on behind it all. The impression for design is overwhelming. And astronomer George Greenstein in his book, The Symbiotic Universe, expressed these thoughts. As we survey all the evidence, the thought insistently arises that some supernatural agency must be involved. Is it possible that suddenly, without intending to, we have stumbled upon the scientific proof of, an, of the existence of a supernatural being? Was it God who stepped in and so providentially created, <clears throat> crafted the cosmos for our benefit? So what is the evidence these scientists are referring to and does it support strongly purposeful design or random coincidences? Okay, but before we move on to that, let's clarify the term, the anthropic principle. Uh, first proposed by Brandon Carter in 1973 and discussed by many others, 
The cosmological anthropic principle basically states that the universe possesses features that are fine tuned uh, to make possible the evidence, uh, the existence of human beings or organisms functionally equivalent to humans. Considering this, however, uh, there is a noted historical moment worth mentioning. Over lunch one day in 1950, Nobel laureate Enrico Fermi, a nuclear physicist, said what has become known as the Fermi paradox. Given the Milky Way's galaxy has over 100 billion stars and could have as many as several billion planets and is already billions of years old, if civilizations similar to ours had developed and if a fraction of these chose to explore or colonize other planets, Earth should have been visited long ago. Where is everybody? This ignited much debate and and subsequent research on looking for life on other planets, which has led to the understanding that um, the universe is fundamentally hostile to advanced life in most places, and that while simple life might be abundant, the likelihood of widespread life forms as advanced as those on Earth is marginal. So what features do we need for life to occur in the universe? Well, we need a just right a cluster of galaxies, a just right galaxy, a just right star, a just right set of planets, a just right moon, and a just right Earth. If you were to write down the address of planet Earth like you would on a letter, it would go planet Earth of the solar system, of the Milky Way galaxy, of the local group of galaxies, of the Virgo supercluster of galaxies. Okay, this is an image. Um, of a typical galaxy cluster. There are tens of thousands of clusters of galaxies in our universe. A typical cluster, a galaxy cluster contains thousands of closely packed galaxies, many dominated by supergiant galaxies. And like an ocean filled with life, the big fish eat the little fish if they get close enough. But life is only possible in a cluster of galaxies as together they provide the much needed elements for star formation and life's existence. For life to survive, however, the galaxy cluster must not have any supersized galaxies as these are often have active giant black holes in their center emitting radiation. The cluster must be one where the galaxies are relatively small and spread out. As this prevents the structure of the galaxy uh, where life is to survive from being distorted by any close encounters with other galaxies. Remarkably, the Milky Way galaxy uh, cluster, aptly called the local group, is exceptional, as exceptional and contains only around 100 galaxies. Two medium sized, the Andromeda and the Milky Way, the Andromeda being the largest. The rest are small or dwarf. Unlike our other typical galaxy clusters, there are no supergiant galaxies and the galaxies are widely dispersed. To add to its unique position, the Milky Way's local group sits on the extreme outer fringe of the Virgo supercluster. Scientists have established that if it were any closer to the middle, it would get swallowed up by the active black hole in the center of the Virgo cluster, or at the very least disturbed enough by the radiation it gives off to make life impossible. Now, we come to the Milky Way spiral galaxy itself. Despite decades of searching and analyzing thousands of spiral galaxies, the Milky Way itself has been found to be unique. In fact, our Milky Way galaxy is the only galaxy in the local group where the existence of advanced life is possible. Why is this? Well, only in our spiral galaxy, as galaxy are the stars far enough away from each other to enable life to endure and our galaxy's spiral arms are exceptionally symmetrical and evenly spaced with respect to each other. This shows that the Milky Way galaxy has not experienced any great life disturbing events like mergers with galaxies, uh, with bigger galaxies or encounters with molecular clouds. A team of French astronomers discovered that the Milky Way galaxy, galaxy is an exceptionally quiet spiral galaxy and that most spiral galaxies resemble the Andromeda galaxy, which has a huge um, warp in its spiral arms, indicating that it has merged with other large galaxies in the past, making it unfit for enduring life. Another important feature is that the sun and, it, and its planet sits in the only place 
in the galaxy um, where life <clears throat> exists between two spiral arms near what is called the co-rotation axis, which means we do not cross the spiral arms as we orbit the galaxy, which would be destructive for life. This is called the galactic habitable zone. Okay, the Milky Way galaxy possesses another unique feature. It's relatively young. Um, much older galaxies have life destroying features like really bright stars and dense molecular yeah. cloud, which destabilize orbits of the planets and shower nearby planets with intense radiation. To summarize, our uh, galaxy in, uh, resides in a local group of 100 galaxies, as opposed to typical thousands. It has no supergiant galaxies, which would make life impossible. It is relatively young, so has avoided destabilizing events. The Milky Way itself, uh, Milky Way is a uniquely symmetrical spiral galaxy. Our solar system sits between the spiral arms of the Milky Way galaxy. The local group sits safely on the outer fringe of this Virgo supercluster. And despite looking far, far away, astronomers have yet to find a galaxy that shares these features that would make enduring life possible. Moving on. Our solar system resides in a very quiet place in space. We are actually 26,000 light years from the Milky Way galactic center. Apart from our sun and the eight planets that encircle it, um, it's all quiet on the Western Front. In fact, if we could travel at 10% the speed of light, it would take us 40 plus years to reach the closest star. However, astronomers agree that our Earth and solar system had to be in a vastly different place in space in order to get the super abundance of elements and heavy metals we and indeed our planets and sun have. A recent published article provides further powerful evidence that the sun formed in a dense swirling cluster of massive stars that both, both enriched the solar system with heavy elements and triggered its formation. Further research has shown that compared to stars and systems of the same age, the solar system is particularly rich in elements that form only in the interiors of stars more than 10 times the mass of the sun. So the solar system is believed to have formed 12,000 light years from the Milky Way galactic center, where the highest concentration of heavy elements are. It occurred in a dense cluster of numerous supermassive stars. This happens to be also the most dangerous place in the galaxy for life. However, even at this point in the history of the solar system, we see evidence of fine tuning. For advanced life to thrive, um, it needs many of the elements in the periodic table and different stars provide different elements. In order to get the stars array of metals, many of these stars would have had to have experienced a supernova explosion and have done this in the vicinity of our solar system. However, if they were to explode too close, they would have obliterated the whole solar system, shut down its formation or disturbed the orbits of planets, of the planets. Furthermore, this showering of the mixing and mixing of elements appears to be anything but random. A study by astronomers from the MIT and Carnegie Institute for Science in 2016 demonstrated that over half the elements heavier than zinc are derived not from supernovas that occur more frequently, but from the merger of neutron stars and black holes, which are a rare event. Okay, but here's where it gets even more interesting. At its birth, the sun and its planets were resi residing in a part of the galaxy where life is not possible. If, at the very least, neighbouring stars would have constantly blasted the system with radiation catastrophic for life. Dr Ross explains, our solar system experiences a gravitational encounter with several large stars that strongly ejected it not towards the centre but away from the star cluster. The sun and its system of planets is hurled away from one of the most dangerous places for life in the Milky Way galaxy, but it gets better. It sounds like something out of the encounter with 2000 leagues under the sea. On its trajectory, our solar system avoids giant, giant molecular clouds, X-ray sources, giant stars and star forming nebulae. But there's more. Amazingly, it encounters another group of large stars 
whose gravitational force slows down the spinning sun and its young planets so that it settles in what would become known as the just right neighbourhood and on the just right Newtonian orbit. Look that up for more info. The solar system originates in the most dangerous place for life and ends up in the absolutely safest place for life in the whole galaxy. Now that, I would wager, is the goal of galactic proportions. Now to give us, now, okay. So central to our solar system is our, is our sun. And astronomers have studied its qualities um, and as intense research has gone into finding a twin of the sun. It's April Fool's Day and you're a twin. Your twin sister is in another class at the same school. So what do you do? You swap classes, don't you? This is exactly the scheme twin girls hatched at my daughter's school years ago. They got away with it because they were identical. It fooled the teachers hook, line and sinker. Because being young, they still appeared very similar in looks. While identical twins are the same genetically, non-identical twins are not. Born on the same day to the same mother, they do not share the same genetics. In recent years, um, there has been a cries of, we've found a twin of our son. However, in closer investigation of it, has, have identified that it was a non-identical identical twin that they have found. Interestingly, the research has shown that there are indeed many stars who are twins of each other. But despite the observational effort carried out in the last six decades, no perfect solar twin to our sun has been found. Okay, I'll just get a finger warning. Someone's got their mic on. I don't know who that is, but it's okay. All right. Interestingly enough, um, it's been this pursuit of the solar twin that has led the researchers to discover unique aspects to our sun. Here are some of them. In order for a planet like Earth to have life on it, the star must be the just right age. The flaring activity of a star, which strips away the atmosphere surrounding the planet, is more active when it's young and more active when it's old. Stars are actually like people, unpredictable when they're young and unpredictable when they're old. Being middle-aged means the sun, unlike many other stars, is very stable. The just right mass. Stars just 1% more massive than the sun burn too quickly and too erratically for life to survive. But suns less massive throw off significantly, significantly more violent flares. Overall, even a small mass or gain or loss produces a dramatic effect. The just right abundance of elements. The sun gives off more than just sunlight. The sun has an above average composition of elements, but not too much as to poison the, the earth with heavy metals. The just right position in the galaxy. Our sun is far enough away from the neighboring stars, a factor protecting the earth from being blasted from deadly, with deadly radiation. Our solar system also has has only one star. Over half the solar systems discovered have more than one star. A two star system, however, is not conducive to life. Okay, the just right orbit. Not only is the just right part of the galaxy a requirement, but so is the orbital path the sun follows. Our sun orbits the galaxy in a manner that keeps the earth away from black holes and other catastrophic areas of the galaxy. The just right distance from earth. In 1966, astronomers Lossif and Carl Sagan determined that it takes a certain type of star with a planet located at just right distance from that star to provide the minimal conditions for life. The star must be no greater than 2% or no less than 2% the size of our sun. Moreover, Earth has a very unique atmosphere. Um, if its distance from the sun was changed by as little as 2%, this will destroy our atmosphere and all life on our planet. The just right dis, uh, luminosity for life. Because we, know, we know, now know the history of our sun, astronomers recognise that we live at the perfect time in its changing luminosity, brightness, where advanced life can exist. Um, the sun's brightness has in fact increased by 15% um, since life first appeared on the planet. Gordon may like to elaborate on this later. About 50,000 years ago, the sun entered a very stable luminosity stage. Scientists also recognise that if the sun were to get brighter by just 0.1%, life on Earth would cease. 
Now, astronomers uh, Melendez and Ramiz, who spent most of their careers searching for a true solar twin, have identified a star which has a number of features the same as the sun, more than any other star yet found. It's lithium, an essential element, and abundance nearly the same as has abundance nearly the same as the sun. Its mass and temperature measured to be the same as the sun. Um, however, it's, it is 15% more luminous or brighter and is also much older than our sun, making it unpredictable. It also resides in a heavy cluster of stars, making its residents unfit for advanced life. Yet the search for, advanced, for uh, a twin star continues. Many astrophysicists have come to the conclusion, like Harvard astronomers Lingham and Loeb, who stated, one may thus be tempted to conclude that complex life is rare in the universe. And Melendez Aramis, who after years of observational study said, and I want you to hear this, the question of whether the sun is unique or not is a question that has important philosophical consequences. An anomalous sun favours some forms of the anthropic principle. So in summary, our sun um, is the just right age, the just right mass, has the just right abundance of elements, is in the just right, has the just right distance from Earth, is in the just right orbit. Um, it's the just right temperature and has the just right luminosity. Now let's take a look at another fine tuning characteristic of our solar system. A popular topic for movies over the last 30 years has been the end of the world scenarios. One of the most prominent is the asteroid collision event, Deep Impact and Armageddon to name two. Of course, this scenario has been placed in the very rare event box because and dismissed because to be honest, we're still here, aren't we? Is there evidence that pertains to our continued existence being extraordinary? Does this point to cosmological fine tuning? Well, the research is indeed revealing more of the strategic role our gas planets play in protecting planet Earth. Of the approximate 4,715 planets astronomers have found, um, about there, yeah, um, outside our solar system, the majority are gas giants. Such planets are more uh, between 10 to 13 times the size of the Earth. Our solar system has four gas giants. Of these, Jupiter is by far the biggest. Jupiter is a whopping, get this, 318 times bigger in mass than Earth. Amazingly, 1,300 um, Earths fit, would fit inside it. Jupiter is indeed a massive, humongous giant. Its magnetic field is 20,000 times stronger than Earth's. It has 63 moons orbiting it. Saturn and Uranus are also gas giants. So is Neptune at 17 times bigger than Earth. Where is all this leading? Well, our planet indeed benefits from having strong shields between it and potential colliders that protect us from catastrophic hits from comets and asteroids. Because of the, its size and proximi proximity to Earth, Jupiter is by far the most important. A team of astronomers uh, led by Harold Levington and Craig Amor determined that the gas giants planets play a pivotal role in deflecting asteroids by a gravitational pull or by absorbing them. The question that has arisen of late is how often these collisions occur. Consider this, it's July the 16th, 1964. It's a relaxing Saturday and you're going about your weekend routine, sorry, 1994. Yeah, July the 16th, 1994. It's a relaxing Saturday and you're going about your weekend routine only to be interrupted with an alert. Comet collision impending, say your goodbyes. Can anyone remember such an alert? Why all the melodrama? Well, there was indeed a comet collision at this date not so long ago. And this collision was fortunately absorbed by Jupiter as described in the NASA article, June the 30th, 2019, on planetary defense. Had this comet hit Earth instead, it could have created a global atmospheric disaster, um, much like the impact event that wiped out the dinosaurs 65 million years ago. Now, astronomers who observed this, uh, comet uh, Shoemaker-Levy 9 in 1994, 
uh, believed that the event would be so rare that they would not see another in their lifetime. However, in July 2009, another collision was observed when an asteroid hit Jupiter. A research team led by uh, La Viga and Shreyas estimated the size of the collider to be 0.5 to 1 kilometres big. They also put the collision rates, both of this type of impact and the Shoemaker event at about five to 10 times more frequent than what astronomers had previously determined. This reveals what a dangerous place the solar system um, is, in, uh, is actually. One of the 21 fragments of the Shoemaker levy generated by itself the equivalent of 6 trillion tonnes of TNT energy released upon impact. This is about 600 times greater than the energy that would be released if the world's total nuclear arsenal were detonated all at once. More fine tuning evidence arose when astronomers, astronomers determined that Jupiter and if Jupiter and, and Saturn were less massive or more distant, such protection would be inadequate and our planet would be pummeled by life exterminating events. But the evidence for fine tuning and the solar system doesn't end here. Writing about the solar system for NASA in December 2019, Preston Dyches discussed the Kuiper Belt. It's one of the largest structures in our solar system, which consists largely of a huge cloud of asteroids and comets. Residing beyond Neptune, this cloud of potential Earth impacting life ending missiles was once seven to 10 times the mass of Earth. From the Nice France model developed, astronomers and concluded, interestingly, that the shifting orbits of the four gas giants, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune, caused most of the original matter to be lost. The total mass of all the material in the Kuiper belt today is estimated to be no more than 10% the mass of Earth, a factor that hugely benefits the continued existence of life in our planet. So in an, art, in an article in the New York Times in July uh, 2009 titled Jupiter, Our Cosmic Pr Protector, Hal Levinson, an astronomer, astronomer from the Southwest Research Institute said, Jupiter and Saturn are so strong that first of all, they threw a lot of junk out of the solar system altogether, lessening the, the size of the cosmic arsenal. Second, Jupiter deflects some of the comets that get dislodged and fall back in. It's a double anti-whammy. But not only that, these planets and um, not only are these planets an ever present big brother, but as Dr. Ross explains in his comments about planetary scientist George Wetherill's discovery, get this. Remarkably, Jupiter drifted in, into exactly the right place in distance from Earth for life on Earth to survive. If Jupiter had drifted any closer to the sun, its gravity would have destabilized Earth's orbit. In fact, the current orbital positions of all our solar system planets are such that they benefit life on Earth as is the fact that for life to flourish, we actually need a delivery system for the elements stars provide. Comets have assisted life on Earth in that way. Okay. So the planets in our solar system show characteristics of fine tuning. What about our moon? You know the, the old saying, familiarity breeds contempt. There might be some truth to this, when it comes to our moon. It's always been there. We make songs about it. We see it all the time. It's not particularly special. It's just a moon. We've landed on it, conquered it, raised the flag. Well, that is true, but in the slightly changed song, don't go out tonight, it's bound to take your life. There's no moon on the rise. Where would we be without the moon? What would life be like on Earth if no moon appeared in our night sky? What if it was slightly smaller or perhaps bigger? Is our moon any different from other moons that orbit planets out there in the vast universe? We all know that the tides are a result of the pull of the moon's gravitational forces, but it's not so well known that the moon plays a key role in maintaining the Earth's vital tilt and that the moon keeps the Earth from um, wobbling violently as it spins. 
Without this anchor at the exact price, precise angle, the days would be shorter and the earth would indeed spin faster. We would suffer from violent weather patterns and extreme climatic variations which would otherwise rule out advanced life. More recent discoveries of planets and the solar system, and the solar system has provided a wealth of information about our moon. To date, the astronomers have discovered over 4,000 new planets, some of which have moons orbiting them. From these discoveries, we've learned that our moon is indeed exceptional. Compared to the mass of its Earth, uh, is planet Earth, the moon is a whopping 50 times larger than any other moon in the solar system. And interestingly, our moon orbits more closely than any other moon yet discovered. So what of it, you may ask? Well, well-known geophysicist David Waltham, studies of the moon's mass highlighted how uh, de increasing or decreasing the moon's mass by a mere one, uh, two percent would affect not only the, the stability, but also how fast the Earth spins and the Earth's surface temperature and rainfall. Underlining all this is a 18 year study by an astronomer, Robin Canop, on how the moon was formed. Um, there were a few th theories on it and, and on how it came about, but one thing is agreed upon. Earth, um, early in its formation, the Earth collided with another planet called Thea. From this collision, um, these things, uh, vital things arose. The Earth lost most of its water, enabling landmass to for now form. The Earth's atmosphere became thinner uh, with appropriate heat trapping capacity, capacity and photosynthesis and air pressure, enabling advanced life to survive. The Earth received a heavy, massive um, metal boost of amongst other things, iron, uranium and thorium, which equipped Earth with the ability to produce long lasting uh, continent building plate tectonics at levels just right for life. Not only that, the iron levels delivered uh, were at just the right amount to support an entire oceanic food chain and also provide oxygen for advanced life. The iron levels would also assist in developing the Earth's magnetic field, which shields the Earth from cosmic rays and protects the atmosphere. The collision produced a moon which as Dr. Ross puts it, gradually slowed the Earth's rotation rate to a life-sustaining level. A more rapid rotation rate would mean less clouds surrounding the planet and reflecting the sunlight, resulting in a higher surface temperature and less evenly distributed rainfall. What continues to astound the researchers is how well planned these events appear. In fact, there's an agreement that the chemical composition of the outer layers of the moon and earth require that the angle and precision of the, of the collision between the two planets had to be remarkably precise. In a review article um, in the world's most prestigious science journal, um, Nature, astronomer Canop complained, current theories uh, on the formation of the moon owe too much to cosmic coincidences. Indeed, they continue to pile up. Remember, this is being said in a science journal. Earth scientist Tim Elliott in the same Nature issue noted that the complexity and fine tuning in lunar models appears to be accumulating at an exponential rate. The, the impact on the lunar origin researchers, Elliott noted, is is that the consequences of, the, of conditions that currently seem necessary in these revised versions of lunar formation have led to philosophical disquiet. Um, yeah, astrophysicist Dr. Hugh Ross summed up the dilemma. The conditions under which the moon forms seem so unlikely from a naturalist view, worldview as to defy credibility. So we've established that the moon has fine-tuned qualities. What about Earth? In the movie Avatar, uh, one of the biggest grossing movies of all time, the theme was Earth was missing unobtainium and we had to go to this other planet to get it. Well, Earth is the unobtainium planet of the universe. We have all the necessary elements from the periodic table and compared to the rest of the universe, our solar system is actually full of these life-producing elements and Earth is in particular has them in significant abundance. Compared to other, the, the other 409 extrasolar rocky planets detected so far, our planet has 
340 times more uranium and 610 times more thorium than the rest of the Milky Way. Why is this significant? These two elements play the central role in driving what is called plate tectonics to form the landmass which we stand upon. But it's not always more that is beneficial. In his lecture, Ross explains, a typical rocky planet the size of the Earth will have 2,400 times as much nitrogen as our planet, 1,200 times as much carbon, and 1,000 and 1, times as much water, which means you'll have a planet with, with oceans thousands of miles deep and no surface continents. Now, um, we have 40 times more aluminium than other planets. Dr. Ross points out that while aluminium comprises 0.01% of the universe's ordinary matter, it makes up 8.1% of the Earth's crust. Aluminium was vital in Earth's early history for driving off high qualities of quantities of volatile gases. We have four times more phosphorus than other similar planets. Phosphorus, phosphorus is essential for life and we have lots of it. Any less and life on this planet would be limited. But there's more. Unlike Mars, which has an overabundance of sulphur, which rules out the possibility of life because of its acidity, we have 60 times less sulphur than all the other planets in our solar system. But probably one of the standout features is Earth's magnetic field, which is heavily dependent on the planet's internal composition. This field, known as the magnetosphere, magnetosphere protects the planet from the sun's solar winds, which would otherwise strip the planet of our atmosphere. Two teams of astronomers have determined that for a rocky planet to maintain an enduring magnetic field, its internal composition must closely resemble Earth's. So the Earth has an overabundance of metals that is indicative of fine tuning. Is there anything else? Short answer, yes. So to finish off my talk, I'm going to highlight one of these, highlight one of these aspects you may not be familiar with, and that is habitable zones. While this research is accumulative, recent findings in 2019 added yet another zone to the habitable zones already identified. This means that in order for life to survive on a planet, the planet must reside in 11 habitable zones simultaneously within its solar system. There is only one planet of the 4,000 plus um, discovered that resides in all, in all 11, and that is, of course, Earth. I'll give a brief summary of each. Okay, liquid water habitable zone, often referred to as the Goldilocks zone, is a region about a star where liquid water can exist and remain. For life to survive for a long time on a planet, research tells us it requires a, habit, a habitat in which frozen water, liquid water and water vapour exist simultaneously over long periods and in, and in which a water cycle works efficiently. Ultraviolet habitable zone is, is that region about a star where the UV radiation arriving on a planet's surface is neither too strong nor too weak um, to provide for life's needs. The photosynthetic habitable zone. Um, there are seven factors which must fall within a narrow range for the wide variety of photosynthetic life to thrive on, which large-bodied, warm-blooded animals are dependent. The tropospheric ozone habitable zone refers to the water vapour that surrounds a planet and affects the atmospheric carbon monoxide levels, which must be fine-tuned relative to its star in order for, an animal, for animal and human life to survive. Planet rotation rate habitable zone. A planet's, habit, um, a planet's rotation rate impacts the reflectivity of its clouds and thus how much sunlight penetrates to the planet's surface. A more rapid rotation rate would mean more light would reach the surface and hence higher temperatures. Planet rotation axis tilt habitable zone refers to the angle the planet must maintain close to Earth's 23 degrees in order to produce a stable climate. The greater the tilt, the warmer the surface temperature. The tidal habitable zone refers to the distant zone um, from its host star a planet must reside in in order to receive the life essential radiation, but far enough to provide 
prevent tidal locking and permanent darkness and light on the planet, or indeed close enough to allow seasons and the tidal effect essential for sea biodiversity and recycling of nutrients. The astrophere habitable zone is the region about a star where the wind it produces forms a barrier which deflects cosmic rays. Atmospheric electric field. As mentioned earlier, for a rocky planet to have an enduring magnetic field, its core composition of iron must resemble Earth. The mass of a planet also affects the magnetic field and thus it cannot be more than 4.4 times the size of Earth. Um, Milankovitch cycles. The Earth's tilt varies by only a couple of degrees between 22 to 24.5 degrees. The greater the tilt, the greater the temperature difference between the summers and winters and ice coverage of the planet. This enduring ice coverage plays a role in ensuring our planet's water reserves and large scale agriculture. For more on this, I'd encourage you to read Improbable Planet where it's addressed at length. The stellar magnetic field, a magnetic wind. The strength of the sun's stellar winds must not be too strong or too weak to protect the, the planet from cosmic rays. Both the mass and the age of the sun influence this. A final point, all these habitable zones must overlap for life on Earth to endure. So considering what's been highlighted tonight, I hope that you can take away the sense of the magnitude that has to be explained in the light of the evidence that science has on Earth. The question for all of us is, could all these things really simply just happen? There are over 4,000 characteristics of the planetary system is galaxy um, and galaxy that must fall within a narrow range for the possibility of advanced life's existence? Or does the fine tuning elements of the Earth, its moon, solar system, star, galaxy, cluster of galaxies, and in fact beginning point to purposeful design and a personal, intelligent, powerful and loving creator? I believe it does. Thanks for listening. Okay, so I will stop sharing and hopefully we will go to stop sharing. Um, yeah. Um, yeah. Hi, I'm, I believe I'm now on. Um, yeah, thank you very much for doing the presentation and I'll just go into gallery view. Um, uh, Gordon, are you in a position you think where you can actually present your talk? I think so. Uh, let me. Uh, I'm in screen saving, uh, screen sharing already, right? Okay, we'll give it a try. Uh, let's see if we can get the. Yes. You're on. Why is your Zoom name completely different to your actual name? <laughs> right. Um, now. I just have to adjust. Sorry about this, folks. I've had to uh, switch computers just briefly. All you need to do now is run uh, your script, run it. Yeah, I'm just going to slide show. Now, I've got a picture of everybody. Um, I haven't got my... Uh, wait a minute, let me move this out of the way. I presented to you, I think, um, Gordon. Sorry? Present a view or something. Yeah, slideshow, just click that. Present a view. No? Yeah, there you go. Yep. Okay. Yeah. Um, where is the present a view? I can't see it. We can, uh, see, it. Right. We can see it now. Oh, well. Yeah. Um, can you see me? Yes, yes we can. Yeah. Okay, I can't see you, but that doesn't matter. <laughs> okay, um, sorry about that glitch, folks. Uh, I was originally going to preface Bronwyn's remarks with uh, looking at the uniqueness of the entire cosmos, uh, not just the Earth. So uh, just bear in mind that this, this would have started the presentation if all had gone well. Um, We'll start by looking at the uh, I'm trying to get the uh, scripture verse up and oh, there we are, there we are. Um, we'll start with this little bit of scripture here. It says, um, 
from Romans 1.20. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made so that people are without excuse. Now, what exactly does this mean? Is God's hands discernible purely from nature, from what has been made? One argument uh, is that we are all made of stardust, and yet we have evolved out of this stardust to be self-aware and to be able to contemplate the cosmos and our place in it. And that in itself is just amazing. But we now find through modern science that the incredibly precise settings of nature, ideally propitious for human existence, were certainly not obvious at the time of Paul's writing, but they are certainly obvious now. There are basically two worldviews, atheistic nature by chance or theistic nature by design. So I'm going to look at the bizarre improbability of our being here. Bronwyn's already discussed the earth. I'll broaden the picture a little bit um, to look at some of the cosmic bizarreness which underpins the context of Earth's uniqueness. There are six fundamental settings of nature, arguably seven, but we'll stick with six, they're the obvious ones. And these essentially define our universe. They're all somewhat to extreme, extremely precise and sensitive to the conditions for life. Um, some of these parameters may seem a bit abstruse, but I will try to explain them, so <laughs> don't panic. The first one, this value n or 10 to the 36. Uh, that is one with 36 zeros after it, which is the ratio of the electrical force to gravity. In the case of a nuclear atom, it is the ratio of proton repulsion to gravitational attraction. If n had been a minute fraction of a trillionth less, then the duration of existence of the universe would have been far too short for biology to have evolved. Also, Gravity would have been so dominant that no pterodactyls, no birds, no bats, no insects, none of these could have existed. There would have been no land, no tides, no waves, no clouds, no rain. Any organism would have been a flat spot on a flat, dark seabed. If N, on the other hand, had been minutely more than atomic bonds and hence the whole of chemistry, would have been dramatically different. And, uh, and, and that wouldn't have been conducive to life either. The second constant to look at is this parameter epsilon, which is the nucleosynthetic efficiency. When two hydrogen atoms, for example, fuse to form a helium atom, energy is released according to the well-known equation E equals mc squared. E is the energy, m is the mass, c is the speed of light. And in that kind of fusion, 7% of the rest mass energy of the hydrogen is converted to radiant energy. 7%, hence epsilon is 0 0.07. If epsilon was 0 0.06 or less, then the nuclear glue would be too weak and no higher elements could form. There'd be no carbon, no nitrogen, no oxygen. If epsilon was 0 0.08 or greater, then no hydrogen could have formed in the Big Bang in the first place. So no water, no useful chemistry could have occurred if epsilon was outside the range of 0 0.06 to 0 0.08. Thirdly, 
Will the universe continue to expand forever or will gravity claw everything back in the big crunch? It all depends on omega, which is the ratio of the density of the universe to the critical density. The critical density is about five atoms per cubic meter. That is the whole of space, um, suns, planets, um, stars, systems of all kinds, in, interstellar gas, and space itself. If you just average out the density, it comes to five atoms per cubic meter. Whereas the density of what we can see is only about 0 0.2 atoms per cubic meter. But of course, there's a lot we can't see. So it's hard to know how much omega currently deviates from unity. But here's the significance. What we can be certain of is that a second after the Big Bang, omega was incredibly close to, but not exactly one. Had it been significantly different to unity, we wouldn't be here. If omega had started off as minutely less than one, then the universe would have expanded too fast for stars and galaxies to form. If omega had been minutely greater than one, then the universe would have collapsed in, it, in upon itself before anything inter interesting could have happened. That is, omega had to be close to unity, to a precision of one part in a million billion or one in 10 to the 15, one to 15 zeros after it. Fourthly, this lambda uh, parameter. This cosmic anti-gravity is a recent discovery and it came as quite a surprise. This is the dark energy, which is accelerating the expansion of the universe, which we hadn't realized until, until relatively recently. We haven't yet pinned a precise value on lambda, but it can't have been large because if it had been, the universe would be, would be flying apart too fast and there would be no galaxies. Therefore, no recycling of stars and generation of the elements that we are made from. Fifthly, some minor irregularity was needed in the early, early universe to seed some kind of structure. Otherwise, there would have been perfect uniformity, just diffuse hydrogen gas throughout the universe and nothing else. This irregularity, known as Q, is numerically and somewhat mysteriously 10 to the minus 5. It's the ratio of two energies, the amount of energy required to break up and disperse structure compared to the rest energy of that structure. If Q was less than 10 to the minus 6, or a million, then interstellar ga gas would never coalesce into useful structures at all. If Q were significantly larger than, say, 10 to the minus 5, then the universe wouldn't have coalesced too much into a cluster of, uh, well, it would, it would just degenerate into a vast black hole, basically. Life couldn't have happened unless Q was pretty close to the value that we observe. And finally, the D value. There are three dimensions of space, which can go up or down, backwards or forwards, but only one dimension of time, which can only go forwards. Why are there even three sp spatial dimensions? Why not two or four? Mathematically, we are not at all limited to only three plus one dimensions. Four spatial dimensions would make the universe impossibly complicated. If only two, then there could be no stable orbits, neither atoms nor planets. And why does time only go one way? The ancient Greeks pondered these questions without finding an answer. Now, of course, we have advanced physics to play with, and still we don't have an answer. 
The compounded improbability of all the reality settings being favorable for life is astounding. The two leading explanations are one, there are uncountable universes, the multiverse theory, covering all possible combinations of settings, and we just happen to be on the one that works. That's a hypothesis for which there is no evidence at all. There's string theory, but then that, that is purely hypothetical. Two, God deliberately created our universe with all the settings just right. None of the above constants seem to be related, apart from omega, which has diverged over time, these and some other constants, like the speed of light, for example, all to be, all appear to be unchangeable and reliable. There is no discernible reason why all these values are just as we observe. Is it mere coincidence that they all happen to be just right? Whether we look at the whole universe on the grand scheme of things or as a sort of intermediate scale as Bronwyn has done, looking at the factors which are conducive to life on earth, the combination of settings is so amazingly close to just right that it, it really leaves very little scope for a thinking person to conclude anything other than God made it that way. Now, you can argue about many of these things, and people do, uh, putting different numerical values on some of these uh, arguments and have some of these constants. However you cut it, the statistics of our being here are just amazingly small. Uh, they, uh, almost unbelievable. Um, I can only conclude God did it. So, um, okay, I'll stop there, and I think it's time for discussion. Can you hear me? Yes, I, I, I can. <clears throat> I, I've just unmuted my uh, microphone. I welcome others to do the same. And uh, can you unshare if possible? Uh, yeah, yes, well done. Yes. Um, thank you very much for both of you for your presentations. Um, just to kick things off, um, I have a few questions of my own, and it's all under my name, but some of the latter questions are from my granddaughter. Hello. <laughs> thank you. Um, all right. Um, uh, regarding Bronwyn's talk about the fine tuning of the planet Earth, like one uh, anti-argument to this is if there's just so many planets uh, in the universe, is it all that surprising if uh, one of them happens to be lucky? So it's uh, like if you are playing Yahtzee, and uh, it's very un unlikely to uh, throw five sixes, but if you throw the dice uh, long enough, eventually you'll just do it in one hit. So um, what have you got a response to that, Bronwyn? Um, well, yes, but every time you throw the dice, um, there are 400 plus, um, conditions that have to be met in order to get advanced life. Microbi micro life, you know, um, yes, you might get more of a chance of it, but for some advanced life like human beings, um, it's more and more remote, um, yeah, I think Ross does get a number to it about what um, you know, the chances are, 10 to the power of 153 or something. But, um, Can I just but, comment a bit on that? Yeah. Um, there are something like uh, 100 billion um, stars in a um, in a galactic system, and something like a hundred billion um, galactic systems in the known universe, and we can make a guess at maybe ten planets per star. So that comes up uh, to um, uh, 
10 to the 100, uh, 10 to the 21. 10 to the 21, yeah, okay, <laughs> pretty large number. Now, you can, we can play around with the statistics all night, but let us say for the sake of argument that the probability of all the factors being right on one planet is only one in a trillion. Yeah. Okay, that still leaves a huge number of planets in the known universe, which could potentially whole life potentially we don't know yeah. what the probability really is um so i i'm not one of these people who argues that earth is absolutely unique it's it's quite likely that there are other planets around um, with uh, sentient beings contemporaneous with us maybe more advanced than us um but you do the math, the back of an envelope calculations, and find out what the what the likely distance is between any two of these planets with life, and it's it's a phenomenal number of light years distant. Um, we're never going to be able to communicate with any of these mm. people, mm. and the the probability of life is sufficiently low that whatever life there exists in the the rest of the universe. It is sparse, really sparse. So um, I, I don't think much is gained by contemplating or, or setting up SETI projects to try and <laughs> talk to these people. I mean, Lee, uh, quite recently, the, there was a star, I forget the name of it, but it's about star 70 shot. light. Pardon? Star shot. Uh, the, there was one uh, discovered quite recently. It was maybe uh, conducive to life. It was a, it was a gas giant, uh, not as big as the gas giants in our star system. Um, it was circling a, uh, a red dwarf uh, quite close. Uh, the, there were a few of the settings that Bronwyn talked about that weren't ideal, but maybe uh, at a pinch, uh, it could, could support some kind of life. Now that's, the only one found of all the exoplanets that have been found so far that had that condition, and that's 70 light years away. So even if we were to say hi to these people, and if by chance they had um, a, a big receptor pointing directly at us, and uh, they were sufficiently inquisitive to keep it pointing at us and listen to what we said, and even if they sent a reply straight at us, immediately, it's still 140 years before we can even say hi to these guys. And, and that is the star with the highest probability, and it's still a low probability of life. But, um, Gordon, I don't think you addressed um, Bronwyn's answer. She said that uh, chances of all these propitious conditions are one in 10 to the 153. So no, it's actually, it's sorry, I'll correct myself, it's 10 to the um, 556. Yeah. That, yeah. And that, yeah, this so, is, yeah. Uh, even if there are 10 to the 21 um, planets in the rest of the universe, that's still highly improbable. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, yeah, I would dispute that number. And I think it would be helpful when quoting those huge numbers to actually uh, put plus or minus some pretty huge error bar, error bounds yeah. on it. Yeah. I, I think I, I, I prefer to listen to, in the sense that uh, the astronomers who are doing the research and their comments, all right, I think it's very telling when they say, you know, we're not, we've just got to uh, come to the, to the conclusion that we won't find any life on other planets. These are the people that have spent, mm. you know, 15 years doing the research no, the, 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 and many of them are huge to that conclusion yeah yeah there's huge uncertainty about it so even yeah. an expert is not going to be able to give a definitive comment but you're right i mean the the odds are pretty low extremely yeah. low mm. you, you, uh, can, next, I just add, can i just add something real quick sure yeah yeah um a lot of the discussion i hear around james webb space telescope is um, uh, about planet hunting. And remember the last mission, which was Kepler, I think, 
we went from almost zero planets in habitable zones with Kepler to lots and lots and lots of potentials. And the James Webb is supposed to actually expand that by an enormous amount. So I, I, I'm, I, I think Gordon's right. We just need to be really careful here because there are expectations from scientists that we're going to change once again what we know of habitable zones and, and habitable areas. Mm. Well, there's another aspect as well, which is we tend to th think of life as we know it. Mm -hmm. Now, on a different planet, different conditions, life would have evolved to suit the conditions of that planet if it was if it at all feasible. So it may be that there are other planets quite unlike ours uh, with completely different settings to us which forms some sort of life, but it's just nothing like the, the, the life mm. that we're used to. Um, mm. You know, uh, evolution will, uh, you know, something will evolve if it can. <laughs> that sounds more like wishful thinking than science, though. Sorry? All of that sounds a lot more like wishful thinking than science. You, <laughs> Very difficult to put hard numbers on some of these things. Yeah, well, a lot of it does is speculative. Like, there's it's not empirical science that you can measure at this stage, anyway. Mm. So, so there, there's much we don't know. Um, but uh, just moving on, um, why why is the rest of the uh, universe so hostile? <laughs> um, uh, like, uh, uh, this is one of the challenges that people throw out. Um, mm. Like. Um, if God wanted life, then why did he make a universe that is, in general was so hostile to life? Do you want to address that, Roman? Well, he hasn't made it hostile to life on our planet. He's mm. made it, you know, very conducive. We've got um, a lot of life on this planet. But I suppose in the in the outer universe, um, um, it... I suppose it depends on what your um, what you believe God's um, aim is for our universe, um, what his plans were um, from a Christian point of view. I'd say that God was planning to create a universe where um, people can come to a knowledge of him um, and uh, where their free will um this comes into that and uh, so containing the evil that we might um, present uh, to one planet rather than letting it escape further out. Um, I, from a Christian point of view, this isn't the end. You know, this universe has a purpose um, to bring us to a knowledge of, of God and Christ and what his redemptive power does. And then it would have fulfilled its purpose. So, um, but yeah, so it's, I mean, we won't find an answer completely to all that, but um, Earth is a pretty remarkable spot. And it, I think the more we look into um, how more remarkable it is and the more things we find out about it, um, it points to the fact that, you know, um, Earth is that that God's got more more to it than than um, just this. You know, it's um, I'm not explaining myself very well, no. but yeah, I Elaine and I were to it. yeah, Elaine and I were talking about this earlier. Um, and basically, we're we're speculating on why would God either have just one unique planet in the mm. whole universe seems very wasteful, <laughs> or would he have lots of planets and does his does his kingdom the kingdom of heaven mm. just consist of people or could it consist of creatures mm. from other other planets we just don't know we have no way of knowing uh, it's, it's purely speculative we do not have the mind of god mm. we do not know what his his total purpose is we can only speak for the, the planet we live on well, when, when you're talking about like the beginning of the universe and the fine tuning involved in one of a better term, turning the knobs. So, mm -hmm. um, or I like to see of it from an anal analogy point of view, baking a cake and you, 
you put all the ingredients in um, and you want an outcome. If you added too much more, like you said tonight, um, we wouldn't be here. And you added not too, uh, not enough, we mm. wouldn't be here. So if, because those elements are so precise from the beginning, it means that our universe is exactly um, the yeah. right size for us to be here. It, it's it extraordinary. Wouldn't work. It's extraordinarily precisely set. And yeah. life, if it exists elsewhere at all, is going to be pretty sparse. Yeah. We can yeah. say that um, with certainty. And it's it's sufficiently unlikely that life to, to happen at all uh, that we can sit here and be amazed that we're actually here and able to, to contemplate it. Um, but when it comes to what is God's ultimate purpose, is it just for us here on earth or is it for others? It's just completely out of our sphere of, of capability to understand. Um, okay. Um, uh, thanks for that. Um, I had a couple more um, questions, but um, I'll skip those. Uh, my granddaughter's come up with several. And so you just consider a couple of those before we open it to other people. Um, uh, Eliza asked, um, where does entropy fit into the constants that you discuss, Gordon? Oh, thermodynamics was never my strong point, but... <laughs> <laughs> um, Tell me about it. <laughs> <laughs> what else might have an answer well, to that? Brian, yeah. do you know? <laughs> Well, entropy is a measure of disorder. So lower yeah, entropy means a higher and, and disorder. And it's increasing, and yes. it's increasing. And, yes. um, and, the, and the universe had a low entropy beginning. Yeah, and... Uh, so if you don't well, know, eventually, you don't know. Uh, eventually, it will, you know, the universe will sort of peter out one way, one way or the other. So either the big crunch or, or it just disperses to virtually nothing yeah. um but you're talking maybe not even billions of you maybe talking even trillions of years before that happens unless god just literally winds up the universe and says okay that's it that's enough heaven's full <laughs> <laughs> yeah well I, I don't don't know how to answer the question neither i um, i don't know how the entropy argument fits in with those six numbers you mentioned <coughs> so we might have to uh, that well, and, and, and the entropy probably the, the, the total entropy of the universe probably varies according to how fast the universe is accelerating away from itself as it were getting bigger and just just expanding um and we haven't got a we haven't got a, high, a an exact numerical value for that so we can't really pin down what the total entropy of the universe is. Yeah. Um, we'll, um, I, I, Eliza came up with another question. What, what would make a universe with more spatial dimensions uninhabitable? And if nothing, why aren't there more? <laughs> more spatial dimensions, if you've got, well, I mean, uh, a three-dimensional universe is complicated enough. If you've got, <laughs> try and get your mind around an orbit in four dimensions. Uh, <laughs> it's so just mind-blowing. Yeah, they couldn't be. I mean, mathematically you can do it, but uh, trying to get your your mind around how it could happen. Um, I think we need to, for the video here, we need to be a little careful because um, extra dimensions is one of the active fields of a number of areas of cosmology and yeah. of, uh, uh, of even um, you know grand unified theories. There's a lot of work going on. We need to be a little careful. No, there's no evidence, as you pointed out, uh, Gordon. But there is a lot of maths. I think we just need to be careful with what we're with what we're pondering about because we'll we'll easily make ourselves. Um, uh, I think you take away the good work of what you've done in the presentations, which which needs to be addressed. I don't want to undermine that. Okay. 
Um, you, just, uh, you made a comment okay. yourself, Tom, on um, um, said regarding dimension string theory and several quantum theories of gravity postulate extra dimensions, and they do seem um, to be in there in some of the maps. Is that basically what you're saying then? Yeah, it is what I'm just saying. And 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 Gordon, I heard you write string theory off a little while ago, and it certainly is true that nothing has shown up in the Large Hadron Collider for supersymmetry. And so that's a big, that, that certainly caused a lot of people to start uh, re-looking at, at string theory. And there's not many, too many people actually working on pure string theory now, according to folks like Sean Carroll and um, yeah, that's right. um, and uh, a lot of the, uh, the other cosmologists. That said, um, there's some great um, PBS space-time uh, episodes. One is on why string theory is wrong and why string th and another one on why string theory is right. And I, I, you know, if the scientists don't know, again, I think we should be a little agnostic. And every version of string theory requires, and M theory, require extra dimensions. And they're generally regarded as being very curled up and sometimes extended in space, but too small. That's why we can't perceive them. Yeah. One of the reasons I... Mathematics can be a very interesting and fascinating field to study, but it doesn't necessarily accurately represent 100% reality. Uh, for example, mathematically, we could have a negative number of people, but in reality, we can't. True. Mathematically, they, they predicted the uh, positron, and mathematically, they predicted the Higgs boson. So we need to be careful. Yeah, that was what I was saying. We need to be careful. One of the things that makes me uneasy about this, this kind of string theory speculation is that it's inherently untestable. There's just no way we can prove it one way or another. So it's not really science in, in a sense. It's, it's, it's highfalutin speculation. Until there's evidence, until there's observation or even prediction, that's absolutely true. And, and I was listening to Sabine Hossenfelder on Unbelievable talk to Luke Barnes, who's actually an Aussie, um, and they were talking about just exactly that. And they were very agreed about that, actually, that unless there's evidence, it's, it shouldn't be called science. If it's not falsifiable, it shouldn't be called science. That's right. In fact, we call it string theory, but it's actually string hypothesis, not a theory until you've, you've validated it. Mm. Uh, there's a comment here from uh, Lisa. It says, <clears throat> with time travel, I know you uh, cannot turn back time. But isn't it interesting how we can celebrate Christmas Day here in Australia and then jet to the USA and celebrate Christmas Day all over again? <laughs> <laughs> That's a good one. <laughs> I like it. That was great. Right. What about the previous one, Kevin? Uh, what, uh, yeah, what's that one? Um, so, about the way Carole, that, yeah, yeah, the way that Sean Carroll and now um, the other only other physicists that I've heard take up the argument this way, um, they basically argue that fine tuning, particularly of the cosmos, um, is, is, is you know when we say it's unlikely, they say that that's actually a a false conjecture. They, they argue that we have absolutely no idea to know whether it's unlikely or not, because we've only got a data set of one. Now, um, I, I mention that and bring that up just because that seems to be an increasingly, um, an increasingly popular way of uh, denying the fine tuning that you guys have presented on. Um, you know, I think that means that what they, they're saying is that the universe is necessarily the way it is. But frankly, I don't think they understand, understand their philosophy enough to actually know that that's what they're saying. And that comes back to the Kalama argument from William Lane Craig, which is, you know, it's either necessity, uh, chance or design. And what they, I think they don't realise is they're actually advocating necessity. Mm. But they're trying, to, they're trying to say that the chance isn't that unlikely because we, we've only got a data set one. Mm. Oh, that, that, uh, I, that data set one argument sounds smells rotten to me. 
So there's something wrong with there's mm. definitely something wrong with that argument. Do my uh, just, not that I consider the existence of God. Um, and you know, poor brother thereof, if I can imagine certain other possibilities from the existing universe, then it must be possible. Or it must be. Yeah. Uh, this is what, what, one of the things that um, is a little bit difficult about what Brahman and I have been talking about is that uh, all of these statistics are extremely rubbery. Um, I, I think however you cut the statistics, the probability of life in, in any one planet is extremely low. But on the other hand, you, the, there are certainly arguments to say that uh, life of a different kind um, based on circumstances which we probably can't even imagine uh, could certainly occur. Uh, just to take the um, uh, some examples on our own planet, we tend to think of life, uh, you know, animal life, as being uh, based on uh, with a, a vascular system. Um, mammals have a um, an iron-based blood, for example. Um, now, nature can uh, nature conspires to modify that in many, many different ways, ways that we, we may not have thought of. For example, the vascular system in cephalopods isn't an iron-based blood, it's a copper-based blood. Um, there are ocean, uh, deep ocean worms, which have a vascular system based on, of all bizarre things, vanadium. Um, the plants have a vascular system which is uh, basically for photosynthesis. Um, chlorophylls, the various chlorophylls, all four varieties of, have a magnesium base. Uh, so, you know, the, nature plays around with the chemistry to come up with solutions which we probably could not imagine. Uh, and if you extrapolate that to other planets and other circumstances, it may be that there are other planets around. With, uh, with life completely different to anything we've, we've thought of or considered. Um, and you can't put statistics on this. This is just pure speculation at this stage. So um, what, what, despite what I've said and what Brom has said, take all these numbers and probabilities with a pinch of salt, they're very rubbery. <laughs> So does the same apply, um, so with all these things like um, the nature of the moon or um, some of those other um, uh, things, if it was a little bit off, life wouldn't work, would, would we get, yeah, would we get a different sort of life if the moon was a bit different or would we get a different sort of life if... I, uh... Yeah. I think you can say that there are many circumstances where the radiation is too intense or or the, the chemistry is all wrong, where life is just not possible. But in, in those, the, there's a large grey area. There's, there's area, there's the earth where we know life is teeming. There's most of the universe where life is ruled out. And there's a grey area uh, where we just don't know, and and we can't even speculate on how big that grey area is at the moment. Um, I'll just add to that, that um, there was life on planet Earth when the moon was um, spinning, well, when the Earth was spinning faster and the conditions were different, you know, in the sense microbiological life or plant life, um, but not advanced life. Mm. So some, some life can survive under those conditions. But, yeah. um, and the know. other thing is that the, uh, it takes a very, very long time for advanced life to form. Yeah. I mean, the, the, yes, you're, you're right. The early microbes yeah. on planet Earth weren't even oxygen-based. There wasn't any oxygen in the atmosphere at that time. Yeah. The microbes themselves created the atmospheric oxygen uh, and that took you know i don't know what the time scale is but many many billions millions of years probably a billion years or so 
Uh, Gordon, would you like to elaborate on the changing luminosity of the sun, the fact that it's 15% brighter than it was at the beginning? Uh, well, actually, it's it's probably a little bit more than 20% brighter than it was right, right. at the okay. start. Um, if you look at the geological record, there's uh, an era called Snowball Earth, where because the sun was so much less luminous than it is now, um, the all, all land would have been covered by ice and most of the sea would have been covered by ice as well. Um, so at that stage, very early on in the, in the Earth's history, um, whatever life, if it even existed at that stage, um, it, it would have, it could only have been very primitive. Now, it's not just the luminosity of the sun that uh, affects the, the planet's temperature. Obviously, carbon dioxide levels uh, affect it as well. And we know that early on, although the sun's luminosity was less, that was to some extent compensated by the fact that the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere was more. So there's more greenhouse effect, and that tended to warm things up a bit. Um, and we will, uh, the sun will go on getting warmer and warmer, uh, probably in about a billion years from now maybe maybe even two billion years um, it'll become so hot that photosynthesis of plants will just not be possible uh, in which case plants die out and presumably um, animals will die out as well if the earth still exists at that point two billion years from now but who knows maybe you know the Lord's return will completely draw a line and, under history and say, okay, it stops there. Who knows? I think uh, Eliza had something to say. Um, it was just building off Bronwyn earlier with that when the earth was spinning faster, there was still life. For example, go back 450 million years to the Ordovician, the earth was spinning fast enough that the day was three hours shorter and there was still life. The thing is, they were not, there were no plants yet, all life was still in the ocean. Mm. Mm. Uh, yeah, I think it, if our mem memory serves, I think it was about 412 day days per year in the old division, something like that. You, you can tell that um, there were some corals and the, the, you can look at the coral sequences, the, the, the minute structure of the corals and, that, and the, uh, the growth rates with the seasons and the moon's uh, precession and so forth. Uh, you, can, you can get that quite accurately. So there was life, um, just not, not much more than, than corals at the time. Mm, actually, there. There have fossils of invertebrate life found. Oh, the uh, you're talking about the uh, trilobites, yeah, you know, the trilobites and around as well, but not on land, not much on land. Hmm. Yes, though there were larger invertebrate species such as megalograpids and camaroceros. Hmm. Uh, sorry, I didn't quite catch that. There were what species? Large invertebrate species such as Megalodon, oh, yes. yes, and yes. Camaroceros. Yeah, some of them were huge. Mm. Um, I, I went to some lectures at King's College um, in in London once, and they had um, uh, very early uh, forerunners of the Ammonites. Uh, they were sort of this size. They're using them as doorstops <laughs> in the Department of Geology. Enormous. <laughs> Must have found a lot then to be able to use some store stocks. No, I mean, they must have found a lot to be sure that they could just use them around like that. <laughs> yeah, they did. <laughs> right, anybody else got questions or comments? Um, yeah, I just want to start off. Uh, one comment I found that both presentations quite stimulating and not being an architect I'm always interested in design and seeing God's handiwork in all the 
the material presented uh, I found really enriching. Uh, my question is, many years ago uh, in, I think, primary school, I was told with the formation of the moon, this idea that an asteroid went past molten Earth and drew out the blob that formed the moon was presented to us many years ago. And then some, uh, that, that was given to us as an explanation. But one of the other things a few years ago I came across, isn't there a law that talks about the moon moving away from the Earth at a certain rate of centimetres per year, which is measurable now. And it's not a huge amount, but it is moving away from the Earth. My question is, if we're billions of years, it should have left our uh, connection many years ago if that law is operational. Does anyone know about that law? I think it's called Raw's Law or some name like that. I don't know the name of the law, but uh, yes, that that is linear extrapolation and linear extrapolation doesn't work. Um, we know that when the moon was closer, quite a lot closer, and it has been processing away and they've, they've uh, there's actually a reflector put on the moon there by the uh, the moon landings and they, they've, they've shot a, a laser out and measured the, res the return time. And they, you can measure it, I forget what it is, a centimeter or two a year. It's processing yeah. away at the moment. Now, that's all tied up with, uh, with tidal effects. And the tidal effects of the Earth, um, of, of the moon on the Earth, depend upon the amount of tidal area, the amount of coastal um, land. It depends on sea level. Sea levels are anomalously low at the moment because of all the ice on the and Greenland and Antarctic and so forth. Um, when you actually sort of work backwards and look at the rate of precession of the moon, when you have um, less coastline because of higher sea levels and because of changes in, uh, in continental drift and plate tectonics and so on, um, you can actually kind of predict, not very accurately, but you can kind of predict how the moon's rate of precession would have been slower in the past. And it must have been slower in the past anyway, because if the moon has been um, orbiting the Earth, well, actually, the moon doesn't orbit the Earth. The, the moon and the Earth are both in orbit around their common center of gravity. But you, you, can, you can do the sums. And uh, it's, if you use linear extrapolation, it doesn't work because you bring the moon in so close to the Earth that it's within the Roche limit, which means the tidal forces would disintegrate the moon and it would just shatter and uh, it doesn't work. So clearly the, the rate at which the moon has been processing away from the Earth is anomalously fast at the moment. Um, when you extrapolate back into time, it's been, it's been very much less, very much slower. I'm sorry, Gordon, I'm going to speak as a young Earth creationist. Um, no, the Moon is a, one of the very quite clear examples of, of why we must believe there was something quite relatively recent, because the Moon, as you say, would have been too close to the Sun. In fact, it must have been creating more because the very fact that it was so much closer to the Earth would have meant greater tides, greater pull, both on the moon and in reverse on the Earth. So that uh, just the basic laws of physics said, yes, there must have been a greater pull and therefore a greater recession, greater recession earlier when it was that much closer to Earth and the uh, tides were pulling back the other way so that it was being tugged backwards yes. and spiralling out at a faster yes. rate. In the Precambrian, that was the case. The rate of precession initially yes. would have been higher because of the uh, the greater tidal uh, yes. friction. Yes. Um, but we're, we're still talking billions of years of the Earth. You, you talk about the laws of physics. Well, the laws of physics also govern those same laws of physics fundamentally boil down to consistency with uh, radioactive decay. And those many, many, there's about 50 different 
methods, independent methods yes. of radioactive decay, many of which have been used on moon samples and proved that those moon samples are uh, was it four point whatever it was a billion years old. Yes, so and you, we, you, you, yeah, you and can't appeal to to uh, you know yeah. physical laws. Uh, on, on one hand, on a creationist view, and then appeal to the same physical laws. Well, I'm, I'm afraid radioactivity, mm -hmm. we've already had this debate. Um, as I say, we've talked about the volcanoes, which you can physically date the eruptions. You go there and find that the radiocarbon, or no, the radio the argon or whatever, certainly do not match what we actually see of physical evidence. Of those volcanoes, be it, uh, I think, Nagahui over there but in New Zealand. They do. Yeah. They do. They 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 match superbly. No, well, not the not the ones that they, they've sent them. Um, what can I say? They've sent them as unmarked samples to the laboratory, so there's no preposition. In fact, uh, I spoke to a, another ge uh, geologist. In fact, he's a flood geologist, and he said they were taught when they were at university that they would take ten samples from their uh, whatever they're doing in the field, send it off and only select the one that best matched their pre-assumptions. Pre now, admittedly, this was an Australian university, so maybe I'm bagging an Australian university for mm -hmm. saying that. But no, it, uh, the samples taken from Nagahoy sent unmarked to a university... Uh, sorry, to I Stephen, Stephen, I don't buy it. Show me, send me... I will the do that. Details. Do send that. me the details that. of that study. I'll do that. I'll do that. And, and I'm pretty sure... It's flawed uh, and because, fact, because yes. there's vast amounts of data, whole libraries of data which contradict what yes. you're saying there. Well, look, I'll, I'll send the ones. On. I'll send the ones. The main thing is you send them unmarked. The laboratories does not have any a priori knowledge of where they came from or make any pre-presumptions on, uh, well, with, on, on what date they should be made. <laughs> Well, I, I don't know how many radioactive dating uh, ages there have been altogether. It's certainly in the millions. Yes. Uh, radiocarbon alone yes. is up to about two million uh, examples of, of dating. And the vast, vast majority are hugely consistent. And when you really examine the minute fraction of 1%, which don't seem to make sense, you find some logical explanation for but it. But you realize, you know, I, I, think you would, you, I think you'd agree that uh, radiocarbon can only be dated to what, 50,000 years? No, uh, yeah, Ma maybe 60,000, but I'm, I'm just giving that as one example, but you yeah. don't have yeah. to take radiocarbon. You can yeah. use potassium argon or argon yep. argon yep. or uranium yep. lead thorium or the, yep. the, about 50 yep. other different methods. Yep. And they're and, all consistent. And, uh, Yes, and there are there are millions of, of dates, geological dates, which are consistent with the uh, yes. with other physical processes and with evolutionary um, dating. Well, as I, as again, we've talked about it before. A sample was taken from the remains of the Mount Helen volcano. It was nineteen eighty, it erupted from an extrusion that was already coming out of there and uh, sent off, and was many hundreds of thousands of years dated at, and yet. We know that no, that extrusion appeared out of the from the molten magnet. Well, also, also, I would have to say that creationists often misrepresent the data, and the, the ages that they often yes. quote are not the age of the eruption; they are age of the magma, and the magma could have been evolving deep in the Earth's crust for very much longer periods. But the creationist articles that I've read don't tell you that. They yes. try and make out falsely that the age the, of the actual eruption is the same as the age of the rock. It's not, there's, you know, there's a big difference between what's erupted at the time and what has evolved in the earth very much earlier. But molten lava is not crystallized. It, it, it's not crystallized yet. It must crystallize when mm -hmm. it goes from the liquid to the solid state, surely. Yeah, yeah. And that's the point where you do get the crystals of the particular elements, and that's when you try and uh, uh, well, match the, the dates. Show, and that, show, that me the happen show me the within, evidence. You know, mm -hmm. you I'd be years. happy to look at the evidence, and I don't believe it. Um, okay. Okay. Yeah, well, look, I just... Can I uh, just make a note? This is yes. off the topic. Um, <coughs> but um, um, uh, by all means, exchange your, your, your information. 
and my daughter wants it too. Oh, Grand my granddaughter. Yeah. yeah, sure, I'll send it. I'll send it. Also, couldn't couldn't an older date be found from a from crystallized remnants from a previously solid state? After all, the mantle is only semi-solid but near the top. The, that happens in many cases of, of granite where you've got bits of country rock or, or xenoliths as, as they're known, um, which can be from near the surface or they can be the lower crust or even upper mantle in some cases. And, and they will have fragments of rock which are radically different dates to the, the, the main matrix material in the same rock. Mm. Uh, yeah, I, I don't want to kind of uh, stifle uh, discussion, but it may uh, be um, uh, reserve this to a, a topic of its own on a single night. And maybe we could have Steve and Gordon <laughs> doing two talks each. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, uh, anyway, uh, I'm getting back to on the topic where people have got some uh, questions or, or comments. Well, do you know, as if we run out of the, on the main topic, go ahead and <laughs> have your argument. <laughs> yes, I want to see you argue. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right, but has uh, anybody got some um, further questions or comments on the topic? Um, Kevin, your, your daughter is sitting there. Granddaughter. Uh, obvious granddaughter. Um, Obviously knowledgeable. I'm curious. Are you studying geology or something? Or she's thirteen. Just... She's thirteen years old. Yeah. I'm just a bit of a nerd, like learning random things. <laughs> Excellent. Yes, I'm all in favour of nerds. Yeah. <laughs> I, was, I was a nerd myself. <laughs> yeah, she had a fetish for dinosaurs at one stage. So don't take her on on that. <laughs> and she also knows all the elements, the atomic table. So. Yeah. What, young, what? young dinosaurs. Yeah, or the dinosaurs? Table, yeah, so. yeah, that was great. Yeah. Perhaps she'd like to give us a a paper one time. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Write a paper. Yeah, she um, doesn't like writing though. I'm afraid. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but you could type it, couldn't you? <laughs> um, yeah. uh, well, all right. What's the time? Is that 45? We can be in nine o'clock anyway. So, uh, look, uh, thank you, um, both of you. They're great presentations and mm -hmm. very interesting stuff. And um, uh, uh, and also great food for thought. So, yes, well, yes, everybody clap. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, um, yeah. Yeah. So thank you fun, uh, both for putting in the great effort and the great presentations. And uh, we really appreciate what you've done. So um, at this point, uh, I will um, stop the recording. Mm -hmm. uh, so um, I hope all the people who are watching enjoyed it, and, but um, we'll cease the recording at this point.